Welcome to the Martin E. Siegel Theatre Centre here at the Graduate Centre CUNY and to Prelude 21, uh, Start Making Sense. Um, it is our annual um, theatre and performance festival celebrating the work of New York theatre artists and ensembles and it's hard enough in normal times to create work for the stage and for uh, spaces inside and outside but in the time of Corona we all are faced with exceptional challenges and uh, we are here to celebrate again the extraordinary achievements that come out of the New York theater community it is time I think and we feel to start making sense to ask uh, questions why are we making theater but also how are we producing it and for whom and uh, this is a great investigation again into the um, mechanics uh, of making art uh, in New York City and we also invited uh, theater ensembles from around the US from Detroit and Cincinnati St. Louis and uh, Philadelphia uh, New Orleans um, to join us and um, this will be an extraordinary look into uh, what is on the minds of artists right now. We also have uh, many panel discussions. Uh, we have uh, an award which we're giving out uh, to honor uh, uh, outstanding members of the New York theater community. So I would like to all of you to uh, join in and uh, get an insight of what uh, is happening. Welcome, everybody, uh, to our listeners, especially back to uh, Prelude NYC, the great, uh, at least we think of it, Prelude Festival that's taking place annually since almost uh, 20 years now, dedicated to the work of uh, theater at the forefront of um, the uh, experimental work, uh, uh, emerging uh, artists, but also season one. So it's a discussion, it's a showing of works in uh, progress, and, um, and we take the stand that art is uh, what is at the center of theater. It's not just uh, entertainment. It's not part of the commercial uh, world. And um, and we here at the Martin E. Siegel Theater Center at the Great Graduate Center CUNY in Midtown Manhattan, we um, use this festival as a moment to celebrate the work of artists. It's very, very hard to create art, any kind of art. It's very hard in theater, especially in America, but now in the time of Corona, of course, there are additional layers of complexities. Um, next to our uh, invention of chain curation, where we ask this time, not just one or two curators to compose the entire festival, we ask curator to nominate one artist and to nominate another curator. And the next curator nominates one artist and another curator. So it was an open forum, a kind of a, a division of a power of the curator. And one of the additional ideas we had for this year is to really look away from the center, from the metropolis, and as some people say, from the metropolitan cultural supremacy that the big cities uh, um, radiate. And then where it says, if you're not here, you're nowhere, and, um, and your work is not of significance or not important. It has never been true. I believe strongly so that so many work has been done outside, whether it was Krotowski, whether it was Virginia Barba, even um, uh, the great theaters in Paris or Peter Brook on the outskirts of the city on Monterre. Um, but um, especially in the time of Corona, uh, we learned that so much work um, is done, important work away from the big cities. Actually, people moved away, moved outside. And uh, in these panels we explored in the previous days, whether it was of care, of self-care, of healing, um, of connecting to communities, connecting to nature, uh, taking care of yourself, your family, your parents, your children. So this is something that was discovered, but I feel um, ensembles who have worked in uh, New York's, in America's region have uh, made those decisions a long time ago. And great work has uh, come out um, from, from, from that we know that and we should know more um, about it and in our Siegel talks where we spoke with over 200 artists from over 50 countries so many uh, put out that we should go work slower take our time like slow cooking get outside the big rushed spaces and uh, there's a worldwide movement and not just here in the US towards um, decentralizing uh, work how it is also whether it's in Germany, it's in Britain, France, in India, or uh, in uh, the Americas, 
um, and so we get a little insight today into uh, the minds, uh, the working mechanics, you know, of making theater. How does it really work? What are the challenges now? Why did they create these pieces um, that they are sharing with us now? So it's a fantastic and unique uh, 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 opportunity for also an honest conversation, for an exchange. They all, it's my guess, it's the first time they're all together um, in a Zoom uh, a talk. So I'm just going to welcome and read the name. So we have with us uh, Jarina Sab. Jake Hooker, Benjamin Camp from the team uh, Sunshine Performance Corporation, Malstrom Collaborative Arts, Natalie Green from Magwumpin, uh, Adil Mansour and Paul Cruz from Hedge Arts Collective, Cara Martinez, Indy Mitchell from Loud Theatre. And as you can see, they are from Pittsburgh, Minneapolis, uh, Detroit, uh, Austin, um, uh, San Francisco, Philadelphia, New Orleans, uh, and it's a fantastic uh, a reminder um, for all of us, you know, that as Hans Thies Lehmann, the great uh, thinker about uh, theater said, theater is a big house and there are many, many rooms, not only for styles, but also for everywhere um, in the world. And um, so we are really proud and honored that you participate, that you took your time um, to be with us. And um, at that moment now also, we would like uh, to acknowledge um, the Lenape people upon whose land we are here gathered today. It's a Manahata, as someone reminded us yesterday, and we pay respect uh, to the Lenape people and ancestors past, present, and future. So thank you. Thanks for HowlRound again for hosting out Andy, uh, uh, Tanvi, and Cactus Juice in Mumbai for helping us to put this all on. And uh, uh, I'm going to start with Adil. I will ask everybody to give a short introduction before we come uh, closer to, um, to 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 the bones and meat of our conversation. So, um, Adil, where are you now? And uh, tell us a little bit about you. Sure. Hi, folks. Grateful to be here. Thank you, Frank. Um, thanks, everyone, for the invitation. My name is Adil Mansour. I use he, him, his pronouns. Home is the is on the ancestral lands of many indigenous folks, including the Adanai, the Hopewell, the Monongahela, the Seneca, the Lenape, also referred to as the Delaware and the Osage, and many others, um, AKA Pittsburgh. Um, I am primarily a theater maker, theater director, and I'm one of three folks working with Hatch Arts Collective, um, which is what brings me to this room today. Uh, Hatch is many things, Hatch is me, Paul, who's next to me, at least on my screen, and Nicole, who can't be here. The three of us have been making theater in Pittsburgh since 2012, um, from scripted work to devised works to a little bit of media practice. And the projects have ranged from a show about four chickens and the gay couple trying to take care of them to a three-year investigation of fracking and environmental justice within our communities. Um, so the work ranges, and that's that's me checked in. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Paul. Thank you, Frank. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Adil, also for doing most of the talking about Hatch. <laughs> My name is Paul Cruz. Um, I use he, him, his pronouns. While I am in Pittsburgh right now for a wedding, I Right now, I'm actually living uh, near my my bio origin family in Minneapolis, which is on the ancestral lands of the Dakota and the Anishinaabe people. Um, yeah, I, I work with Hatch Arts Collective. I'm so grateful to be here. Thank you so much, uh, Jake, for uh, for reaching out to us. Um, uh, my work with Hatch is primarily as a playwright, and then my work in the world is also um, as a playwright and a media artist. And so, yeah, thank you so much. Fantastic, Kara. Hi, I'm Kara Martinez. I'm coming to you from Austin, Texas, which is the lands of the Comanche and Tonkawa. I work for Fusebox Festival, and in particular, I direct a project called Live in America. And Live in America is a new festival that is imagining festival as a justice-oriented space for enriching communities, uplifting histories, and building a shared sense of stewardship. Right now, we're working with uh, communities from Vegas, from Albuquerque, New Mexico, the Diné Pueblo and Apache people, El Paso Juarez, uh, New Orleans, Detroit, Sumter County, Alabama, San Juan, um, and Northwest Arkansas. 
incredible. It's a great festival you create. They have been there and it's fantastic. And, um, and it's good to, to be reminded of it. Natalie. Hello, uh, my name is Natalie Green. I use she, her pronouns. I am based in San Francisco and I am the artistic director of the Device Theater Ensemble Mugwumpin. Mugwumpin was founded in San Francisco in 2004 by Christopher White, Joe Eslack, and Dinmo Ibrahim. Uh, it has had many iterations over the last 17 or 18 years. What is math? Um, Mugwumpin has long been uh, San Francisco's sort of weirdo devising people. And one of the things that we've noticed uh, at this time in our trajectory is how impacted our work has been by our collaborations with various designers and how, uh, especially leading up to the pandemic and in pandemic times, we realized we were really creating uh, design forward work where we would actually, the initial collaboration would be with a, a video designer, a lighting designer, a costume designer, that the, the seeds of a work could grow from uh, strong design ideas and that mm -hmm. we could build the rest of our performance around those ideas um, and invite performer creators into the mix to create things uh, with these strong design ideas or ideas about audience performer interactions and how sort of uh, immersive and interactive work um, could really drive the, the creation Fantastic. of new and original performance. Mm -hmm. We love site-specific work. Um, big weirdos over here. And um, forgot to mention that I am here uh, in San Francisco on Ramaytush Ohlone land and um, a land that has seen many gold rushes and many different uh, eras of people coming through um, with new ideas. And um, really uh, San Francisco is a history of change. The land and the people here and the artists and the ideas have always um, you know, uh, one on top of the other. We are built on layers, and um, that is, is literally geographically, metaphorically, creatively, layering and layering and layering. Layer, it's, uh, layering. Fantastic. We yeah. look forward to hear also much more on the discussion. And thank you, Natalie. Benjamin. Hello, hello. Coming to you from the beautiful city of Philadelphia, which is the ancestral home of the Lenny Lenape, among others. Um, I'm from Team Sunshine. I'm one of three co-captains, as we call ourselves, founding founders. Uh, we started in 2010, and we also make uh, devised work from scratch. And some of that has been small duets, and some of that has been 100-person battle scenes done in parks. Um, currently, we're, we're working on a, a couple of different pieces that explore working with communities in different ways. We're trying to be outside a lot and uh, recover from a totally shitty time to make theater. Woo! Um, and uh, yeah, very excited to be here. Thank you so much for having us. Of course, it's, it's great to have you with us. Indy, so great to have New Orleans with us. Hey, hi everyone. My name is Indy. Uh, my pronouns are they and he. And yeah, I'm calling in from New Orleans, also known as Balbancha, the place of many tongues. Um, yeah, I'm excited to be here. I wear many, many hats in the world. And I'm here today representing Loud, the New Orleans Career Youth Theater Ensemble. Um, Loud is uh, amazing. It's, I've been co-directing Loud for about like four or five, like five or six years now. Um, we yeah, have done a lot of different things and our goal is mainly to create new work um, that's completely devised by our ensemble, who are all young folks between the ages of like 16 and 21, um, to create new work with them and to also be doing some political education alongside. So the work informs that political education, the political education informs the work. Um, yeah, and we could talk more about it later, but I'm excited to be here, excited to see new and familiar faces. Fantastic, thank you. Thank you, Shireen. Thank you. Um, I just wanna say first off that I am experiencing a little bit of lag. I hope you're not, but I am, but I'm just gonna push through it. Okay, great. Okay. Um, so again, my name is Shireen Azov. I'm the co-director of A Host of People. We are uh, on Anishinaabe land, which is the Council of the Three Fires the Ottawa, Ojibwe, and Potawatomi peoples, um, colonially known as Detroit, Michigan. Uh, a Host of People is a multiracial theater ensemble. We make devised work that looks at the past to talk about the present 
in order to imagine a more just and celebratory future. Um, to give you a little bit of texture of how that manifests, um, we really like to play with both the head and the heart and the light and the dark. So we'll have a whole spectrum of um, really sort of serious dark materials and then maybe we'll break out into a song and a, and a hustle in the next moment. So we really sort of um, paint that entire spectrum in order to bring the uh, most amount of people into our work. Um, yeah, I'm so, like Andy said, I'm so excited to share this space with so many friends and colleagues from around the country. I mean, this is really sort of where uh, my heart lies outside of Detroit is like the connections that we make um, across the country. So I'm excited to be in conversation with all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Jake, you are also our curator. Tell a little bit about uh, yourself, but also you know, what went through your mind when you thought, I'm going to invite these guys. Yeah, yeah. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for being here. It's so great to see everybody. Um, yeah, so uh, my name is Jake Hooker. I am the co-director with Shireen of A Host of People uh, in Detroit. And so uh, Shireen gave our land acknowledgement. Thank you for that. Um, and I am also a, the curator of this. And I think that's a funny sort of concept, the, this idea of curation. I don't consider myself a curator, really. Um, but no, you are. It's your first time. Now, now I am, I guess. Uh, it's probably not my first time. But anyway, um, yeah, so this 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 grouping sort of developed out of my PhD dissertation, which I wrote at CUNY Grad Center, um, and uh, Frank was on my committee. That was very nice. Uh, and um, the, the sort of so you know so as I thought about as Frank reached out to sort of say, you know, are there artists we want to uh, kind of uh, you know touch base with out around the country, uh, not based in New York? You know, there's some. Um, uh, sort of, for me, low-hanging fruit, because I've just been working with a bunch of folks in my dissertation, but not all of these folks were a part of that, and that was uh, by design. So a few uh, um, folks here were, uh, Team Sunshine and Hatch were, as well as Maelstrom Collaborative Arts, who are um, in Cleveland, who weren't able to join us today. Um, and uh, Goat in the Road in New Orleans uh, was also a part of uh, the dissertation. Uh, but I wanted to sort of uh, choose a few of those artists and a few uh, uh, new artists. And so uh, actually, I'd like to take just a second to sort of talk about my uh, thought process around those selections, uh, because I think that one thing that's evident here is, well, I mean, I guess this happens when you're a curator, right? This is really reflects my uh, tastes, loves, and passions, right? Uh, I love all of these people and all of their work. Um, but I also love um, uh, to think about, I love ensemble. So all of these folks in one way or another, you know, are involved in ensemble making uh, and ensemble thinking, I think. Uh, and, um, and so that was, you know, one thing. A lot of these folks, although not everybody maybe uh, identifies as divisors, um, Although maybe everybody on the screen in some way or another considers it themselves divisors. And part of that was uh, uh, thinking about place. And so uh, I wanted to choose folks that were really working with the place that they are based and the communities that they're based uh, in. And devising obviously gives us a framework around making place that's kind of connect or making work that's connected to place. And so that was a really important part of thinking about um uh, who to ask, and you know when I wanted to get a range. So just to uh, to talk about some some specs of this group, uh, Mugwumpin is the farthest from uh, New York, and they are the oldest company uh, uh, that is uh, in evidence in this little pan U.S. group grouping we have. Um, and then uh, uh, to say, you know, Kara is not necessarily a leader of a uh, or a member of an ensemble current. Well, maybe you are. Uh, you can tell us about that. You know, but uh, working with Fusebox and this amazing Live in America project that I felt really has um, a spiritual, ethical relationship to to this Pan USA I, curation moment, but also sort of, I think, a lot of the things that a lot of us are thinking about being uh, in community uh, as, as Shreen said, you know, in a lot of ways, outside of the uh, the artists in Detroit who I know and love, 
uh, this is my community. These folks that are uh, working outside of, and I hate to, you know, we talk about decentralization. And so I don't want to, you know, at Freelit Festival, which is an intrinsically New York based festival, I want to sort of acknowledge that, but, and also not just um, kind of differentiate ourselves from what is New York, right? Or, or that kind of bugaboo. <laughs> <laughs> that is New York. Um, so, uh, so yeah, so that was kind of like the thought thought process around this particular group of folks. Um, uh, okay. You know, no, go, go ahead, Frank. Yeah, those, thank you, thank you. Um, um, Jake just mentioned the word, and I know it's important to him, place making. Um, so it, before I said, do you all know each other? You all have worked together and so you are, in a way, a community. Uh, Indy, you don't know uh, all of them. But I others, know others, everyone, but I know some folks on the some call. Folks, but still, it's uh, wonderful to know that it's such a big sense I of community. I feel like I should say, like, one organizing kind of element mm. to this is a lot of these folks come we come into contact through a couple of national organizations, like the Network for Ensemble Theaters. So all of us are, or not all of us, but most of us are members of that of NET, and we sort of intersect in that way. National Performance Network is another um, out of New Orleans, who a lot of us do get, you know, sort of traffic through. And um, NIFA, New England Foundation for the Arts, is another organization that a lot of us have been, uh, you know, funded by or have a relationship with. And these are three organizations that I think are really, really crucial to helping to create infrastructure for folks that are not in New York, especially people that are making experimental uh, performance where there is not a lot of infrastructure for um, experimentalism, right? Yeah, and um, and that is that is a quite um, quite something. So when it comes to to making plays, how how is that at the moment in general, but also in that moment of Corona, the last year, this year, the work you create here? Tell us and share a little bit. Um, of uh, what's on your mind. Um, Adil, maybe again, we start with you. Yeah, I'm still kind of sitting in that question. I mean, we Hatch spent the first seven years very specifically making work with, in, and about Pittsburgh, consistently responding to our communities. All three of us have very, the founding members have very different relationships with Pittsburgh. Um, but at this time, at this point, I've been there for our, um, you know, anywhere between 20 to 10 to 20 years. Um, the last two years, we've all kind of scattered um, in a lot of different ways. So I went to grad school, even though I was in Pittsburgh, it did not feel like I was in Pittsburgh <laughs> anymore. Um, Paul spent time in Austin. Nicole started working with NET, um, a national organization. So even though we still had ties to Pittsburgh, the work kind of started to expand flowed out of it in different ways. Um, and currently we're making a lot of um, mediated work. So Paul's working on an audio play. I put up a virtual performance. Nicole's working on a digital archive. And so all of a sudden, I guess our place is this internet we sit on, which is perhaps <laughs> a shared experience for a lot of us. Um, and place right now for me is like my mom, um, who I don't get to see a lot. Place is the memories of my father. He passed away seven years ago. I've been thinking about him a lot and making work in response to attempting to have like a conversation with his ghost, whatever that means. Um, so, you know, he has no relationship to place in certain ways. Um, so maybe the the internet times um, are doing that to my brain. It's like what I have to share right now at a very, uh, writing and draft, writing and draft here. Yeah, yeah. And uh, for a time we saw the internet it's not a real place very long, and now it became the only real place for a while, but we, we are getting back. Um, Indy, how is it for you? How is it filmmaking, theater, um, performance, ensemble work in New Orleans? Give us a little update. How is it? Yeah, I mean, as everyone I'm sure experienced on this call and around the world, it's, it's weird. Um, it's just weird. <laughs> and I don't know how sustainable it is, um, if I'm being honest, but... Um, Loud has been doing, using this time to do some more internal work. So we've always like pushed ourselves out there as a youth centered, adult supported organization. And um, the pandemic has given us an opportunity to sort of like slow down and really like reconsider what that meant. So in the past year, we've staffed up in ways that we've never been able to do um, and have hired four new 
youth staff members um, who then we spent a lot of time like prepping them, getting them ready, getting them oriented, getting them confident, building out new curriculum and the plan for the next semester. Um, and yeah, and then they're like the plan right now is for them to run the whole shebang, um, which I guess we'll start in January now because um, Hurricane Ida happened. We were planning to have auditions in um, September, late September, early October, and the hurricane definitely <laughs> like took us off track for a little bit. So we had to push things back a little bit more. Um, and that's the thing that I'm learning from this pandemic too, is just, I don't know, letting go of these expectations of like, what am I supposed to be doing and creating and in what timeline um, and giving myself grace uh, and all of us grace and time and space to actually slow down, to remember that um, none of this is normal and there maybe is no normal now. And like, to, and like having to wrap your brain around that is really hard, especially when people's safety and health and well-being um, is like, yeah, is at the center and the core of it all. So like as much as I want to like just jump back into a studio or into a rehearsal room with people and have shows and make new work and stuff, I also, yeah, I don't want to die or like get anyone else sick or like have like or have like the audience uh get sick or be from exposure and stuff like that it just doesn't feel safe like even with vaccines and everything but i'm really excited about the internal work that we've been able to do and um and in part is because of some of the like financial support we were able to get um not this year but the year before the pandemic even started um we got like a really awesome grant from Alternate Roots, like a renewing three-year situation that's able to like help sustain us during this moment. Um, and yeah, and in general, people have been like really awesome when it comes to like fundraising and stuff. But yeah, it's weird. It's actually kind of funny and weird to be on here for loud because I've so like pushed myself uh, to be like, yeah, usually I would like invite one of my younger staff members to, um, to sit in my place. Um, but after talking to Jake and because of time and stuff, I was like, okay, I think it's better yeah. and easier for me yeah. now. But yeah, but thank you for joining us, giving us an update. Benjamin in Philadelphia, um, t tell us a little bit about making. What's the real? What's the reality of creating work there at the moment? Yeah, I mean, it's it has its ups and downs. Philadelphia has actually a pretty incredible devising scene. It's it's a uh, kind of happening place for that kind of experimental theater, like. Everybody's got a cabaret act. Um, so that's very cool. And it's it's felt really lonely the last couple of years. I mean, that getting together and being being that devised community is one of the things I really love about Philadelphia. And so, yeah, it's felt lonely. Team Sunshine kind of looked around and, and briefly explored the possibilities of doing work online and doing audio plays. And, and we looked really hard at it. And then we were really tired and we had families we were taking care of. And we were like, I don't think we're going to do any of that. And we decided that we just weren't. So we kind of wiped, wiped out all of the performance hustles. Um, and that they're slowly coming back. And, and the way we're mostly doing that is, is, small and slow and trying to figure out things that are COVID independent. So the last work in progress showing we just did was with a very small audience outdoors. And it was a piece, it's a piece that's designed to be outdoors. It's set on a loosely on a father daughter camping trip. And so we said, okay, that's the piece we're going to work on. Um, but it's, it's been tough. And it's partially we're finding that the slowing down, we, we're also experiencing some slowing down and some questions around sustainability for ourselves. The, the slowing down is not costing less. So there's a real, there's a real universe of like, okay, cool. We're going to slow down. We really have to take care of people. Actually that costs a little more than, than just do using our volunteer hours to make the work. So how do we talk to foundations about what it means to slow down sustainably? Um, but we're, we're just kind of dipping our toes in work in progress showings, thinking about doing our work in like, in, in phases, we're gonna show this phase of the work. We're gonna do this phase of the work instead of saying, we are going to premiere work on this day because who knows? Who knows? There could, there could be hurricanes, there could be there could be more COVID. So we're trying to be a little smaller in how much we promise. <clears throat> yeah, um, yeah, the great theater maker, George Tabori, the Hungarian one said, any work he does is work in progress. He's just forced to stop uh, on one day to have the opening night, so um, exactly, exactly, and that's not how that's not what we've been doing. That that's a new that's a that's new, new for us. 
So, so Natalie in San Francisco, give us a little update um, about uh, what, what are you thinking about what, doing work? How hard? How easy have, is it? Do you get support? Oh, I think it's been hard. I think it's been hard on everybody in different ways. Um, San Francisco is a place where interdisciplinary work has been really welcome. I, I originally moved to the Bay Area as a dancer, as a young dancer. And I worked in the dance theater community for a long time before I decided I, I wanted to figure out how to be an artist without being an athlete. And that's what took me towards devising. And when I found Mugwumpin, I was like, okay, good. This is my home. And um, one thing that's been really interesting for us stepping off of a producing cycle during the pandemic is just having deeper conversations about our sustainability as a company. So I really appreciate hearing from Indy and hearing from Benjamin about, you know, how do we take care of ourselves and each other? So we actually, um, we realize we're nearing the end of our life cycle as a company because we are not necessarily sustainable and we really feel like it's important that, that theater and devised theater acknowledge larger movements towards better labor practices. So when we look at the, the demands, both from We See You White American Theater, but also from all kinds of um, social movements that we're, we're experiencing, that we're in the middle of, how can we really honor and acknowledge that we need to treat people a certain way, we need to treat our labor a certain way, we need to honor and understand what our real capacity is, because I feel like we were always with Mugwump and like the little company that could, and we were so consistently doing shows that were a little bit bigger than what we could really handle. And that, um, that aspirational quality is a part of what made our, our company so special. And at the same time, it meant we've been running on burnout for a long time. And it's been so special to do shows that were just a little bit outside of our reach, always doing things that were just a little more ambitious, a little bit of a crazier idea than the last time. But, you know, 17 years of, of doing that has, mm. has a way of uh, helping you dream big. And also at this time, the pandemic allowed us just to slow down and go, is this healthy and sustainable for us? Now that we're mid-career artists, it feels different in your bones. Mm. And um, so we're still in big conversations about what to do with this and how to be real and respectful, both with our history and mm. with our capacity. Yeah, and often, you know, see theater ensembles are like music bands. They get together and they play time Nobody knows how long the bands last, and they just play together as long as it's right and feels right. And um, but yes, it's a, such an enormous effort. Um, uh, uh, Cara, um, all the changes we saw um, or felt, Black Lives Matter, you know, the Me Too movement, Dear White Theater. Um, you have a little overlook of regional theater, and um, Jake, so you might maybe you know most of about it. You know, if it comes to someone in the U.S. Um, what do you detect? What do you feel? What are people thinking? How is your work changed? And uh, what are you doing different? I mean, I don't, I don't know. I mean, <laughs> I'm uh, pretty practical about the power of white supremacy. I, I hope things like Black Lives Matter, um, Me Too movement will make a difference. But white, you know, white capitalism, white supremacy is real and powerful. So I'm not gonna put it like a rosy glow. I mean, I think you just do the work that helps your community and you, you survive inside that labor as long as you can to try to take good care of yourself. And that that is kind of the challenge. In Austin, you have um, a city that was really productive and devised work in the early 2000s. Rube Mex were making tons of work. Um, Refraction Arts, which was the company before Fusebox, Salvage Vanguard, Rubber Rep. And then Austin gentrified. It is a gentrified city and it is very expensive to make work here. Um, and so it had already slowed down prior to what was happening uh, in COVID and these regional uh, or these social movements. Um, I think what I try to think about in scholarship or if I'm working in a regional theater or working in Fusebox or, or live in America, which is like getting at this idea of how do we 
unmake place? How do we uncouple place from dominant history? And that when you do that labor, which is messy and it can be hurtful and it takes a lot of um, energy, when you do that labor, then you can maybe begin to remake systems. But until you deal with the dominant history, the dominant system, like that's that's the key into into how I think about like changes in regional theater, effectiveness of social movements, effectiveness of a little festival in Austin, like uncoupling place from dominant history and naming who wasn't included in that history. Mm. Um, do you pick up things from the companies you invite and work with? Is there a change in themes, new styles, or new work? New work? Is there anything you detect? I so, so the communities we work with um, have their own leadership teams and every leadership team has selected for itself what it wants to program, how it wants to budget, how it wants to create artist fees, like it's contextual material. The thing that I can tell you across the communities I worked with, um, none of them self-selected into uh, standard theater or standard performance practices. They have older, richer, deeper histories, and that's where they want to. That's where they want to head. Um, in Albuquerque, they don't want to do experimental performance. They want to talk about like an experimental powwow as a structure, mm. and and even that isn't experimental. It's like kicking it back to history that was erased, um, and that's kind of consistent across the board. Like I'm working with um, artists in New Orleans. You know, they don't want to do. Uh, a traditional play, they want to talk about street and porch performance. And so part of it is just reorganizing my brain in the way that I've been um, trained to think about theater and performance and recognize that that thinking has um, a history and that I've got to disturb my own practices around how I understand theater and performance. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Thank you. That's that's so good to hear. What what is out there, Shireen, um How is it in Detroit? Are you welcome? Is it is it gentrified? Can you do your work? Is it growing? Is it shrinking? What's new? What are you, what are you thinking? About? Oh, um, wow. That's I just want to. There's so many things I could echo about what people have said so far, but I'll I'll try to add more. Um, I mean, I think one of the things, I mean, we arrived, this is our 10th year in Detroit. Um, and I think that a host of people is made up of a variety of people that are Detroit natives that have been here from, have you know, grown up here. And some people that have adopted Detroit as their home. I mean, now this is the point, um, I've lived in Detroit longer than I've lived anywhere else in my adult life. So it is, d does feel like home to me, but I, I, I'm, I do feel like there is, it is a, it is a city that um, welcomes collaboration, but uh, at the speed of trust, as Adrian Marie Brown would say, you need to come. We came very intentionally, listened, and and sort of found our way into the the way that we're collaborating in a very interdisciplinary landscape. Um, I will say, right now, it feels hard <laughs> and i think everybody feels that way it feels hard to feel connected to our community in a way that we have not felt before it feels um hard to i mean i was i've been listening to a lot of podcasts that have like verified these feelings like in the beginning of the pandemic when we were in lockdown it felt somewhat better because we knew what to do you know there was like very clear you can't do anything and now in this very gray moment it feels um, harder to know that we are taking care of everything, our people, our work, all of that in the way that this moment calls for. I know we need to push ourselves a little bit, but also we need to make sure that we're taking care of anybody. We, uh, when, the, when the pandemic started, we had two shows in development. Um, Kilo Batra, which is a companion piece to our last show, which is supposed to premiere at the Air American National Museum in December. I'll talk about that in a second. Um, and Fire in the Theater, um, that is a devised piece that is about free speech in the digital age. Um, so we went totally virtual online to keep the development of that going. I will say last week was the first time we did an intensive on Fire in the Theater. And in three days of being in person, 
we got more done on that show than we had throughout the entire um, time on Zoom. It was super productive. It was super joyous. People re like reconnected to the material. We had great conversations on Zoom, but they just weren't like getting to that next place of how does this manifest into live performance for us. Um, and then with Kilo Batra, so that was supposed to premiere in 2020. Fire in the Theater was supposed to premiere in 2021. Um, we sort of really had to stretch our idea of what devised theater could be <laughs> because uh, we engaged two writers that were supposed to be in the rehearsal room with us devising together. And because of how we had to move everything online, we basically had the writers write the piece themselves in conversation with me, which is very outside of our process. Mm -hmm. um, and that is, we're going into rehearsals for that next week. And it feels like the hardest producing and making we've ever done. Like there's mm. not just like practically, we spending more money or spending money on tests weekly that we didn't have in the budget. We're dealing with a variety of um, comfortability with being in the room together and it's manifesting in ways that are, you know, how do we take care of each other in the room? What is our behavior gonna look like outside of, um, how are we gonna change our behavior as individuals outside of the rehearsal room to try to make everybody feel safe. Yeah. And um, just how, how, and for me as the director of the piece, how am I staging it differently? Which is a interesting, another yeah. level sure. of, yeah. of art making, right? Yeah. So there's a lot of things to think a lot about. Of things, a lot of things, and it's a, a moment, I think. And Catania at Lincoln Center Theater said, you know, we go next week into rehearsal. I haven't done it in a year and a half. Um, it is, feels so strange about it. We heard from one of our curators that at their place, half the staff, two times the performances they normally showed up, you know, and prices go up for audience members. There's extreme pressure. They do more now all of a sudden, plus all the concerns. Um, so it's a it's a, a strange moment, important moment. So it's good to hear from you. I would like to ask a, a question um, hope and with an honest answer because a lot of people are listening in. They, should I go to a city? Should I join or should I create an ensemble? Um, Jake made that uh, um, a point that you know this is a, one of the great things you can actually do in his society. You know, go uh, out, create a unique community, find a place, redefine a place, unplace a place, but then place it again um, through your work. Is it worth it? <laughs> what was your idea? Have you been able to realize it, and is it worth it? So I'm going to stand out a little bit of it because that's also what people would like to hear. You have your pioneers in a way. You went out, but pioneers also get the arrows in the back. Um, but um, but still, and maybe we start with Paul and our others. You know, so what? How would you answer that question? I think I'm going to take a couple firm steps back from the pioneer metaphor. Yeah. Um, I, uh, yeah. And I mean, and I think Frank, you know, that, that question too implies that we were coming from other places, all of us, which I think is definitely not true for everyone here. Um, and I can speak for myself. I went to New York and I had lots of New York connection. I was surprised. It was also one of the reasons I put the panel together, you two, Jake's work. There are strong connections, you know, to, to a city where a lot of people stay, where everybody comes from somewhere. But you went, a lot of them went back. Yeah, and then I should say for myself, I definitely did not grow up in Pittsburgh. I grew up in Western Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. um, but a thing I would, I would say about making work just for me, and I think this might be true with a lot of folks here, is that it's deeply personal and deeply about personal connection and community. And so I moved to Pittsburgh because my best friend moved here, who's, I guess, this way on the screen, a deal. Um, and so looking out, if folks are, are watching who are also theater makers and artists, I, a thing that has been hugely important for me is finding a community of people with whom I, I connect and relate, uh, finding sometimes an unhealthy codependent family <laughs> with whom I can make work. Um, I think I'm way more interested in that than going to a new place and recreating that place. Like, I think I found that um, certainly outside of New York, I don't personally have a ton of connection to New York City, but it, I think it's about like looking around where you are, which is something that happened to me a lot in the pandemic, is that my geography dissolved in that all of my friends who I knew in other places, I was suddenly in relationship with more on a regular basis, more than I was before. But... 
I also knew my block better than I ever had before. I knew who lived on my block. I would like uh, through front porch culture, it would start waving it, you know? And so the relationships kind of shifted in that way for me. So. Hmm. Anyone chime in? Yeah. What um, I just oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, that was. Oh yeah. So um, yeah. I just wanted to sort of echo some of those uh, things that I'm hearing out there, and uh, you know, the, but this I laughed pretty hard when you said, you know, is it worth it? Um, and you know, I think it. You know, <laughs> I think it depends on what the it is, right? Um, that. Uh, you know, for me, on and I'll, I'm speaking as a as myself and as a uh, founder of a host of people, less as a curator. Um, for me, you know, ensemble has um, or, and creating our ensemble company and really, you know, intentionally putting these these uh, folks together has uh, really been everything to me. I mean, it has created helped to create a framework not just for my art practice and the fact that, you know, like as art artistically, I do like a bunch of different stuff, but not just what, you know, I don't locate myself in one particular area. So ensemble has been a way for me to, to do that just sort of practically speaking, but also, um, you know, having built this family together and, you know, I mean, you know, so like thinking about is an ensemble worth it is sort of like asking is family worth it? You know, you know, it's like, it's got its problems, <laughs> right? Uh, uh, and uh, but you know, I think for me anyway that um, the the process and during COVID times, we all, like it, as Indy was saying, we did a lot of internal stuff, a lot of rethinking about our internal structures and kind of developing new ways of um, even thinking about the ensemble itself. Uh, and that felt that has all felt so generative to me, and so uh, I'm actually getting sort of emotional. Uh, you know, so uh, that's really where my heart's at. But the question I think that really becomes what, why, <laughs> it's such a dumb question. Why? Like, what now? Like, why are we doing the work that we're doing? And I think all of us obviously have to answer that very independently. Uh, but for me, you know, I, I do see the structure of an ensemble in a place like Detroit, which doesn't have a lot, a lot of this type of making, but is a very interdisciplinary landscape. Um, you know, the, the, the building of this ensemble has, has, has been way beyond just any given piece. And, um, so that to me is, you know, I, I think that's worth it for me. I can only answer, you know, that has been really worth it for me, uh, well beyond just like making a thing. Um, but, uh, do I think everybody should rush out and start a new ensemble in a new place that they don't know anything about? No, I do not. All <laughs> right. You got to know your place, right? Uh, like literally, uh, Ben, what do you got? Well, I was just going to say, I, I'm, I want to like note, uh, similarity is that people are tired. People are tired and th this work is incredible. And I think I, I, I would also say like, if you want to have the best artistic relationships of your life, like it's, there's something about the creative language of divide, doing an improvisation with someone you've been working with for 12 years, that is incomparable. It, that's like a truly a truly precious creative opportunity. And also I just hear, I'm hearing exhaustion from y'all and from other people I'm talking about. It's like pe people are really tired. So I, I think I, I agree with everyone reframing the question of kind of, is it worth it? But I will say that I would love to get the word out to the foundation universe and the government universe that this is incredible work that's doing incredible things that's that is way under supported, way under supported and has relied for an incredibly long time on volunteer hours donated by artists. I mean, that's what we're all really doing. We're, we're donating our time and uh, people burning themselves out and missing opportunities to, to have traditional families or um, do the things that they want to do in some cases. So, um, yeah, it's, it's under supported, but it's also, God, it's such an incredible it feels so good. Mm. Mm. Um, I'll jump, I'll jump in for a sec. I mean, I also want to say that we just had an ensemble retreat with our with eight people of our ensemble this last weekend, and 
um, talked a lot about the evolution of a host of people. And, and it's interesting, a lot of the people that have been in Detroit their whole lives, like there still is that New York pull. And I, I want to honor that as well. And I, I spent six years in New York and I spent nine years in Seattle and now almost 10 years in Detroit. And like the, the, I do think there is value of like the New York experience, but I don't think it's about the quantity of the work that is in New York. Like, I think, I think it's the, for me, one of the things that has been so liberating leaving New York, but I did have that experience was um, that there was something about the New York thing that made me feel like I had to make work in relation to what was going to be the it thing in the downtown theater scene. I feel very liberated outside of that system to respond to me and our ensemble's artistic in instincts of our own. And I felt, and I've seen almost everybody's work in this room and I have felt that like statistically, it's, it's so interesting that I've been moved by all of your work so much more than like the amount of, and I've been moved by work in New York too, but like as I moved away, like what that, that unspoken thing of people doing it outside of New York was, is there's a, a an honesty, a sincerity and a tenderness that I think is now coming into New York work in a way that, that I think has been happening outside of it for a long time. And I think part of the pandemic has been letting people open up in New York of being like, we're people <laughs> that can be sincere on stage and even in experimental work that I wasn't feeling as prevalent in the years that I lived there. And how, I mean, as an additional question, but please chime in any time the connection to the community, to the place. How are the cities, how open are the arms? Um, do you um, do you feel you are part of the fabric? Uh, do you make a difference? How 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 are you ex how are you experiencing in general, but also of course in time of COVID? How are you experiencing this? How are you all experiencing this moment? Um, these are such interesting questions, Frank. Um, they're really making me think. Um, and yeah, so I am originally from Virginia, um, a small town outside of Richmond. I moved to New Orleans in 2013. Um, and yeah, I made roots and seeds here. And in those first two or three years of moving to New Orleans, um, I didn't make any work. I wasn't really in any ensemble, I didn't do, I, and there's a couple of different reasons. One, I got sucked into like some like party thing and like was just <laughs> doing that for a really long time, which I think draws people into New Orleans. Um, and it's an interesting, weird energy or whatever. And then um, a few years later, I was like, oh wait, what am I doing? I'm supposed to be making stuff. Um, and so, I don't know, this is an interesting conversation for me because I feel like, I don't know, as a as like a black queer and trans person, it's hard to figure out like where am I supposed to be or belong or something. Um, and I find, and I found myself coming like a person coming from a smaller rural town, um, going to larger cities felt good, better for me. But I've never been drawn into New York, and I think it's because New York thinks that it's the center of the universe. So even these questions being like very like. Like, should you move? And I'm like, are you actually like asking, like, should people go to cities and start doing ensembles? Or are you asking, should people from New York who aren't doing well? Well, the question, yeah. Go to this other places? And so like, I mean, both of those answers, to, uh, my answer to both of those is no. Like, don't come to, don't come to New Orleans. Don't come to Pittsburgh. Don't come to Austin. Like, as like all these people have said, these gentrification is a major like thing that like, I think we're kind of like, mentioning, but not really talking about the impact of like, what is the work um, that we're doing and how mm -hmm. our work as artists impacts gentrification, because it starts off with like the young artists and the young queers and like the young whoever, the young like professionals coming in, but then eventually we get pushed out too, but like we started it, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like acknowledge that like people on this call, like we have such a huge, um, I don't know, like we have, like we, we started and like, yes, we're looking for place and yes, we're looking for like, 
you know, our community to make our work. And there's nothing wrong with that. But also, I think it's important for us to acknowledge that, like, these places exist both before and after us and without us and without our art. <laughs> you know what I mean? And so, like, um, I don't... I don't know if it's important for us to even talk about like, does this place welcome you with like arms or whatever? Because no matter where you go, it's going to be work. You can't just like enter into places and think that like you're the first person to think of like making weird performances on the street. Like everyone like, <laughs> so I guess um, my, the thing that I would love to like, you know, leave with people is like, if you're going to move to new places, like we all do, we're all looking and searching and stuff, just be intentional, be aware of like, what space you're in and like, and also be intentional, like, and how much space you take up, who's been there before you, who's been doing work before you, how do you, how does your work fall into the lineage of the work of that place already? Um, and then also thinking about like, how does your presence there impact the work that's being made, impact the community that's being made as well too. Because the other thing I really noticed about this call too is like, yeah, it's great that we're all not in New York, but we're all still in major cities. I'm like, shout out to the rural homies who are out there making work because like they exist. I mean, I know that they exist. Like there are people in like Kentucky, there are people like in like smaller outskirts of like Georgia and like all of the places, like not just the southern states too. So <clears throat> yeah, yeah. I can say that. thank yeah. you. This is great though. This is very interesting. A reminder of like <laughs> I am where I am. I'm actually here, so. yeah. Cal Indy, thank you so much. That was so that was. I just want to just like lift up all, so many of the things you said. It was really, really uh, needed. Thank you. Yeah, I just want to echo that. Don't move to Austin, please. Don't do it. It doesn't need you unless you have a lot of resources that you want to share and and that you want to like do some reparations with. Um, and also just think about as you as as you go into those places. What are your habits of thought? Like, how is your ensemble functioning a little cult-like? And, and how do you break up your own habit of thought? Who's not in the room with your ensemble? And how might they make you better if they were in the room? And I just think of New York as that same, it's, it's like a very distinguished art cult. And it's great. And you can go in and get what you want from it. And then you can leave. And there you go. Hmm. Yeah, no, I think uh, we should have a, a very, very strong um, regional theater system, which there is, as you all point out, you're in big cities and uh, in all places, in all towns, as there are actually in many places around the world, and even the smallest towns, you go to the Catskills and there's a town of a thousand people and they have a little opera house, and this is what makes um, life um, um, enjoyable, it celebrates life, we ask the questions, society works through um, in its, um, um, its problems and you look at it on stage and it's a model for something. You look at it, you see it. So I feel um, what you guys do is uh, so essential and important and um, perhaps if you will forgive me my more provocative question, but I think it's uh, missing and there should be a variety of theater offerings, whether it's device, classical, you know, international, global, or uh, native uh, indigenous cultures and often hybrid forms coming out of this. Well, it's thing it's not missing. It's yeah. not missing. It's there. It's All there. The but it's saying, it's you, not supported in a way. It's not, supported. Supported. it's not in the forefront. It's not being yes. presented in New York. It's not being presented sometimes in like MPN or like all these other like regional places too. But these things are there. Like that's yeah. the point like that I was trying to make before. Like yeah. the, the, the assumption <laughs> that like whatever we're doing is so special and new as if like people haven't been doing these things already. Yeah. And these things are there currently. Yeah. Yeah, long, long, long project from the Ford Foundation. You're know, founding, founding the the theater system. But still, we hear how complicated it is. What have you learned uh, uh, in your work? What have you uh, learned? Where you say these are experiences? If anybody, you know, does that, what's available for you for anywhere in the world? But what do you feel um, you have learned? What is something special about uh, the work of your ensemble in your place? I, I, I'll just just to say just really briefly I mean I think part of it for me is like is is learning you know I think 
I am still very much learning uh, and, and unlearning a lot of things uh, that, and I, and I, I, I want to just, yeah, like I said, both what uh, Indy and Kara said, I think was, is so important. Uh, and that, uh, you know, I mean, I'm a, I'm a white man that is, came to Detroit an 80% black city to you know make work and so i need to know i try to acknowledge as much as as is possible uh but also you know i just all i can say is i am it's far i've 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 benefited by far more than detroit has benefited from my presence right like detroit the communities that i've gotten to work with have just made me a better person <laughs> not a better artist, a better person. Uh, and part of that was, uh, you know, I really need, I was like really into the, you know, New York downtown theater bubble. I mean, I was, I was the bubble, the bubble and I were one. Uh, and so breaking out of that bubble uh, was really crucial for my further development. So, yeah. So I want to say, you know, uh, and, and also just what Indy pointed to about the partiality of a, a, a some assemblage like this, right? These are just, some companies in some cities doing some work. But I do want to say, I think it's emblematic of a, a, a network and a web of folks all over the place that are making work like this and like other things that are unsupported. And um, and the key for me is those folks that are making work in, uh, you know, in relationship to their communities and to the, in their worlds, right? Um, so yeah, so I'll, I'll, I'll pass it off to somebody else. I think um, a thing that I'm constantly learning and the work that I do um, is one to remember that it's not just me. It's not just about me and my needs, my comforts, my desires, my name in big lights or whatever, uh, my name on grants. Like, it's not just about that. It's a, it's like there's so many other folks who are um, being touched or impacted by all the stuff um, and, the, and the work that I do and that continue to touch and impact me to continue to like, motivate me to do the work because um, yeah, it's it's been a struggle uh, through this pandemic to stay motivated to do anything. Um, but yeah, make art. <laughs> and and yeah, and I think this uh, thing that I am learning constantly through this work um, and I see the world is like starting to catch up because of like COVID, it's just like the importance of like, um, yeah, of like, the importance of treating people like whole humans who like need things, <laughs> who need to like be taken care of, who need to be fed, who need to be like paid and compensated well, who need support with rides, who need support well with like, I don't know, maybe professional support, who need, maybe need a new computer, like all of the things like, like to center, I'm learning the importance of recentering like people and human needs and everything, not just in the work that, uh, the creative work that I do, but also like the organizing that I do and um, and just like the day-to-day -day living that I do. So I can't just like take things out on the random guy who's being a jerk um, behind the wheel, <laughs> like trying to remember in all of the moments that like people are human and um, and deserve to have their needs met. I want to speak in draft to borrow a phrase from a deal because I, I want to ask this as a question is something I'm thinking about like do we think that because our work is unsupported that there is a brokenness in the way arts funding is working or is it are we just making visible a brokenness in kind of our communities and our society like is it is it because white supremacy and capitalism are working actually and maybe the arts funding is working exactly as it's intended to be and what we're trying to do is to work around okay so that's the statement part the question is i mean how does that impact us yeah uh, i mean if you work in an under-resourced community and you go in and whine about your arts funding I mean, that is like the the first, I'm like, oh, there's some privilege and entitlement right there. I don't have enough arts funding. Like that's like, I'm dead in the water if I go into a community and do that, given all the different, um, you know, they're resourced in people, but maybe maybe not resourced in money. And, and so I think that that as artists, we have to like step back and acknowledge the privilege and entitlement we enter spaces with. And, and one thing I'm trying to think about right now is how 
are our producing systems inherently barriers to access? Um, requirements for documentation, expectations that it's all just documented anyway, even especially when you're working um, with rural communities, people who don't have the resources to document what they're doing, um, that these folks will come in and speak art speak in the way that you understand art speak, that um, they'll have established writers, that they write contextual language the way that you want, like that, that those, those, um, those are, I'm thinking a lot about like how we ourselves create barriers in our own producing technologies and trying to question my own habits um, around that. Adil, what's, what comes to your mind? Yeah, I mean, it's a question Paul and I and Nicole talk about a lot. Um, and so my brain right now, I mean, I'm listening to all of us talk about how necessary care and rest are, and we know this, and we understand this as human beings, as caregivers, as artists, of course. And one thing that's been true in a lot of my experience, care and rest seems afforded to folks with resource, right? It takes like inherited wealth, massive amounts of stolen inherited wealth to have access to consistent care and rest. And the kind of resource it takes for me to have like even three days available for me to just be with myself is like astronomical having grown up very poor. And that inherited wealth is really, really visible in a place like New York, where the amount that it takes to simply make rent here and to start to be involved in the arts community here and the kind of wealth and access that that requires. And yes, there are folks from many diverse experiences of income making work all over the place. That is like a given. Yet I can also acknowledge how much wealth is necessary for that work to come out of like openness and like what happens to my mind when it's available. And then that dovetails with the reality of thinking of like, so, okay, if it's not inherited wealth, it's these like huge, huge, large scale grants, you know, Things like that, you know, give a single artist $250,000 or $600,000. And those come out of, and all the artists that are getting those grants, especially recently, I'm so excited about. There's also a reality that those are like often closed nomination circuits. And those nominators are some of the best curators and thinkers and writers of our time. But often those folks are located in New York or other large cities. And it's the people they know, it's the people they run into. And then those become geospecific. And so, okay, so the alternative to inherited wealth are these large scale grants, which are also then still somehow like closed off. And how, like all these amazing people India is talking about in parts of Georgia that I've never been to, how will they ever be in a room with someone that will know someone that will know that curator that's gonna be like, I love the thing you're thinking about. How do I get you support? And that is exhausting. And that makes me wanna just like go to bed. And I think that's why ensemble is addictive, especially for folks coming from marginalized spaces or under-resourced communities. It's, it's a manifestation of mutual care, right? Like me and Paul and Nicole, no, we don't have access to a ton of resource. We have what we have, but like, I love these two people a lot and we like laugh a lot. And then that's like space in my mind. And that lets me make work about my mom. That's like sincere. And there's a lot good there but it still isn't like helping me pay my rent. Um, and so those are the, I, I, you know, I don't have, I don't, that's what I have to say and I'll stop there. Benjamin. I'm, I was just thinking about, I, I expect, um, our, our mug weapon representative is still having internet issues, but I'm just thinking about um, them laying the company down and uh, that's super brave. I mean, we've, we've talked about, um, keep, we keep checking in and going to a point and either saying, okay, it's done or handing the keys to some young people and saying, please drive goodbye. Um, and that, yeah, it's the, the thing that 
even that foundation money comes from a dark place. <laughs> so I'm just thinking about um, the kind of systematic redistribution that would bring that would bring resources to those people. I think for for us, we are thinking a lot. We we're, we've sort of we think about all of our work as a, as an experiment. So everything is an experiment. We're always trying it out. It's this is always a, everything's in draft. Everything's in work in progress. It's always an experiment. I think the thing we're we're thinking about right now, in terms of community and interacting with community, is is thinking about each piece as having a a, a really tight family in it, and thinking about um, you know naming naming like three to six individual people that we want to be in conversation with, and and kind of narrowing the scope in that way, and that's feeling for us like it. Gives a gives brings purpose to the thing that we're doing in a way that it, it can feel. Yeah, I'm I'm hearing people think about who who are we representing and who represents us, and even the word community means everything and nothing. Um, so we are thinking a lot about how, how are we making that specific for ourselves? How, is, how are we artistically in conversation in that way? And I think the question around support feels enormous and systematic and, and I don't know what the solution is. And uh, now I'm wondering, <laughs> I'm, I'm being, maybe I'm too being too inspired by Mugwumpin, but there is something incredible about the artistic family that that gets to be built and we're trying to think about how are how are we including a very specific community in that feeling of family as we're creating um depending on what the piece is about i'm not sure which question i'm answering anymore but that's mm -hmm. the things i'm thinking about yeah. as we're having this conversation yeah Kara, are you are you concerned? What do you what are, or do you see? Is it nationwide going up? Um, as we know, there is so much theater being done all across the U.S. in some ways, but the funding um, is decreasing. Um, people, feel, especially in the time now where people say we have to, you know, feed babies, people in hospital, people are sick. You know, why are it and all it, all of it? At least, what I hear, foundations are actually also shutting down. Um, how do you, what do you pick up from your network, is, or do you feel that is? Uh, support out there that wasn't because people say that actually is important. Um, what I know, just to be like Frank, is that if, if I build a network that includes wealthy white people, I will find a way into a resource or grant land or the conversations that Adil have mentioned that are, are I've, I've said in those conversations, they're like sealed off and secret and, and, and that, um, yeah, that, yeah, that's how it works. Um, I am the beneficiary of an enormous amount of grant funding from the Walton Family Foundation. Um, and my job in thinking through it's dirty money in the US, it's all dirty money, is someone mentioned this earlier. If I receive those resources, then how do I effectively send them back out the door as to the greatest extent that I can? And the conclusion that we came to is working across the nine communities we work with and allowing each of them to determine the spending on their projects and their own artist fees, their own budgets, their own project proposals, so that I am not imprinting on them my expectations of, of what pr production or, or productivity looks like in their work. But, but a deal named it. Like that's how the system works. It's how the curational system works in festival circuits. It's a, it's a very... Um, similar group of people who are making decisions about what circulates in festival systems. Um, and so I just think about, I, I've been lucky to have uh, a big education. I've been lucky to be in rooms with people who had a lot of resources or have and have a lot of power. And so I just think about as, as who I am in the world, how can I tactically navigate those systems to redisperse resources to people who can't get in that room and then who don't have access um, to those resources. I, I want to name a tension that's definitely come up in Hatch and Kara, I think, you know, in our conversations too, because 
um, and it relates to care because how in doing that do you also then care for yourself and sustain your artistic practice and your life and often that looks like paying yourself <laughs> you know and i'm just i don't know i'm curious how other folks navigate that tension the tension of paying yourself Serene, I sort of want you to talk. We really want to try to answer this, but our dog is barking because there's things happening outside. So if that becomes too much, just start waving at me and I'll, I'll just mm -hmm. shut up. Um, you know, we uh, three months before the lockdown, it was the moment that we decided to have our first staff person for host people come on full time, me. And then the pandemic hit. And that was very scary because like we took a jump. We haven't had a staff person. We've been paying everybody by project and the lead artists or the co-directors and the producer had not been being paid. Um, I get paid, I, I, the way that our language holds that is I get paid, I am an employee of the company, I work for the ensemble. It's not just, that's how we frame it. I get paid at the same rate as everybody else, $15 an hour. It actually doesn't come out to $15 an hour because I work about 60 hours a week. So there has been, and we addressed this sort of at the, um, retreat this last week of how to Jake, will you please take over? Can you, can, do you think you can take over? Thank you. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, we, we bring Trin on, of course, uh, uh at, in, during the pandemic also meant that we, um, uh, we were able to, you know, we, 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 Traverse the pandemic pretty well because Shreen was doing so much work in the care and feeding of the company during that time. But anyway, we went to this retreat and um, had this retreat and sort of talked about that structure and, you know, tried to allow or have our ensemble kind of opt into uh, the, the, the ways in which the budget gets um, sort of allocated and sort of think about, um, uh, you know, group transparent budgeting um, in addition to, you know, we have a core ensemble who gets kind of a, um, an additional fee outside of projects. And um, those folks, I did, it's been a real experiment trying to figure out how to make that work. And we had folks kind of opt into thinking about um, what kinds of activities, what kinds of tasks could they take on within their capacity that would equal the fee that we were able to offer them. And, um, you know, so it's just one way of us thinking about how to, to allocate funds. You know, I mean, one of the things that's great about Ensemble, to be honest, is, you know, that we can um, kind of take some of that uh, wealth, that dirty money, and redirect it to folks that ultimately wouldn't have access to that money. And, you know, Shreen is always talking sort of like, you know, open the door so that folks can kind of learn some of these processes. Because I mean, I guess one of the things I want to say, and I, and everybody might disagree with me, <laughs> which is good. Uh, you know, it's like all of these things being true, but for me at least, the the answer for me is not less art, right? Like I, you know, I, I mean, maybe less of certain types of art, you know, and more of the better types of art. But I don't know, you know, I'm just sort of not. I don't want to suggest for at least for me to be like, well, we're the, you know, we're all backed by dirty money. So what we're doing doesn't have validity. Right. Like I think art is important. I think it's valuable. I think it's important. I think it's, I think it can be transformational. It's not always, it's usually not, uh, but it can be. And so, uh, you know, the, the people in this call do for me represents, you know, a certain kind of hope. Um, I just want to also add that, like, in regards to the funding, we have started to add a ensemble care line into our budget. And uh, the last, uh, we put a small amount last year, or no, we started in 2020. And so it's, this is the second year we've had in our budget. And we have yet to be, like, questioned by, by our funders. Like, they haven't pushed back. And I was expecting more pushback of being like, how are you? using this ensemble care, which is like the way we're using it right now is like there's some sections that people, they just need to access money for mental health. They can do that. If they need to access money, we're putting in on like a lot of our work deals with really triggering material. Like how do we put days in our process that like we 
like do yoga instead of rehearsal. We do a sound bath instead of rehearsal. Like we also have it as a community care so we can volunteer instead of going to rehearsal that day to give ourselves, make us feel like we're back in our community. So like this is the ways we're trying to subvert the funder, like the funding system that we do find ourselves in is how, how are we taking that money and doing something else with it that is a part of our art making. It absolutely is. It absolutely is a part of who we are in the world and and how we manifest the, the, the work that we do. <clears throat> we have about uh, 10, more, uh, 10 more minutes and I think um, um, we have, have so much more to talk about. I think this could be a week long a panel to get you know to learn for me too you know to 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 <clears throat> ask even better questions uh, but let's talk also a bit about the work and that's being presented maybe car for your you have a little overview but all of you can chime in the work the projects tell us a bit what what is it what what are the ideas um and the stories or where do they take place what are you all feel inspiring at the moment where you feel this is actually uh um something um you know, to, of significance. And we also picked you, of course, because we feel that work, what you do is of real importance. People should go and see it. But tell us a little bit about what what are the what are the projects? What what are the thinking? What's the thinking behind? What's new, unusual? I think in terms of the Live in America and its work, what, I mean, it is like all nine communities are doing radically different work. Um, and, and I, but the thing that maybe is connecting their habit of thought is that they're not particularly worried about the boundaries of form and structure. Um, so from Vegas, we have like an installation that's made of cardboard and it's about spectacle and there's queer clowns and then you're moving through it and then you go outside and there's a pantsless cowboy barbecuing and leading a community barbecue and that's performance in Vegas. And then you have a queer powwow coming out of Albuquerque. Um, out of Juarez El Paso, it's folks who are thinking about what it sounds like to be in the crossing process because you live in both, oftentimes folks live in both those cities simultaneously. And so it's that crossing of borders and race has a particular sound. So sound and performance um, are merging. Puerto Rico is a really queer cabaret. There's a lot of Mazzola oil involved. Um, Detroit has a lot of like protest music that they've selected coming out of Detroit. Sumter County, Alabama is throwing a homecoming. It's storytelling, church music, barbecue. Um, New Orleans is doing, they're bringing in a porch where every surface is playable. It's from Music Box Village. And those people are throwing down porch and street performance. And so the thing that I have learned from all these communities is that I bound my own thinking a lot in narrative and form. And when you don't, magic happens. And yeah, so that's what I'm seeing happening. Thanks. Yeah, all of you chime in. and But your own work or stuff you've seen where you feel this is uh, inspiring. I can go next. Um, so the work that we're sharing, the loudest sharing here, um, it was like our first uh, virtual performance that we did. So the it's made by the ensemble who started in person and then we like went through the pandemic and they're like, okay, well, we're gonna keep going or not. I like gave them the choice or I didn't give them the choice. We like presented, we talked about it and um, folks decided that they wanted to continue making stuff. And then so we made the show, The Scarlet Rebellion. Um, which, yeah, it was like really timely. Like this show premiered like maybe like like right before all of the uprisings happened. Um, and so it was like awesome to, yeah, just to like see them dreaming and thinking about like the future as it was also happening now, um, as it had also happened in the past. Like a, a big thing that we do at Loud is we try to incorporate some sort of historical research component um, in our, a uh, semester at some point, whether it's like ends up being like a true seed to the show or just being a thing that we use to talk about, I don't know, awesome people who are queer who make art in the past. Um, we just, uh, it, it could be a, a tool for representation. That's what I should say. Um, yeah, but it feels like really important for us to be looking back as we're still continuing to look forward to. So yeah, I'm really excited for this new uh, group of folks who are going to take on this like hybrid world that we're trying to figure out now and like the balance of meeting in person versus not and how we can 
I'm, I'm not really, I don't know what that's going to mean in terms of performance. Like, I don't know if we're doing an in-person thing. I don't know if it's going to be virtual. And sometimes that's really scary, but also it's really exciting. Yeah, I can quickly get Hatch started and then toss a tea ball. Uh, Hatch is presenting three like segments of three different pieces. Um, all three of the co-founding members are currently in the midst of doing uh, family-centered like uh, documentary work-ish. Uh, I've been adapting Sophocles' Antigone as an apology to and from my mom, uh, working with my mom on a new play. I'll use Nicole's word to describe her project, her words. She says that um, she will share brief examples of work from sprawling personal and family history. The work is probably about anticipatory guilt, memory loss, um, anticipatory grief, memory loss, severe guilt, and bad geo websites. Um, and Paul has a piece that's part of it as well, of course. Yeah, I've been drawn a lot to audio work in the pandemic. Um, mm -hmm. It's for whatever reason feeling more live to me. And so I um, am working on an audio play right now directed by a deal called Once Removed. And it's uh, uh, me exploring uh, my, the, I learned recently that I have a gay relative who died during the AIDS crisis and it's laying his life next to mine. Um, and then the project is expanding this fall. I am right now in the middle of a bunch of interviews with queer folks who grew up or are living around where I grew up in Western Wisconsin and um, hopefully gonna expand this into an audio series, maybe a podcast. Um, I just want to plug Adil's Amigan too. I'm obsessed with this project. It is so beautiful. I cried so hard. <laughs> um, and also Nicole's project, which she intends for no one to see. So, <laughs> Nicole, I know you're watching. Hi. Yeah. Benjamin, yeah. Um, so Team Sunshine is is working on a, a few different shows. There's each, each show has a lead artist, and so all three of the co-captains are kind of guiding a process. Um, so we're working on a piece called Your Optimism is Not Required, which is about um, parenting, climate grief, um, and race. It's um, there's it's set outside at a, on a camping trip, and there's a, a father and a daughter. Um, and, and we're intending to cast a teenager in that role. It's being written and to eventually incorporate a, a teenager. Um, and we've done some work in progress and it's been really beautiful. Part of it is that the audience is very small and they're sat in a circle. And so it's secretly just a campfire where everybody gets to um, feel connected to each other <laughs> and make eye contact again, um, which is which is new. And then uh, Makoto Hirano is the lead artist on a piece called The Great American Gun Show, which is right now in research phase, having conversations with gun owners uh, a lot of them in Bloomsburg, Pennsylvania, um, and also uh, Asian, Asian and Asian American identifying gun owners and non-gun owners about gun culture and safety and gun ownership in America. And then Alex Tora is uh, the lead artist of a piece um, probably called Yanto or Hear My Cry, which is about um, queer queer Latinx identity and is very early stages. So it's going to be incredible, but we don't know that much about it yet, but it's going to be amazing. So we're we're in the research phases of, of each of these pieces and developing how each of these pieces is in conversation with a specific group of people and, and how those uh, grow over time. It's probably going to take us like six years to make all those shows. So mm -hmm. call me in 2020, whatever that is, 2027. We will. Yeah. Oh, shoot. Sorry. Can I say one more thing? We're working on oh. another project that I forgot and that if I don't mention, <laughs> I would be foolish. We have another project called The Sincerity Project, which is a 24-year iterative autobiographical piece about an, an ensemble. This, would, this is the fourth iteration. So there's two years between each iteration. Um, each piece responds to the last two years. So the last two years, shit has gone down. Um, and things have changed in a cultural conversation. So that ensemble is growing and changing. And we have a guest director this time, but uh, that piece is in December. So if you're uh, anywhere near Philadelphia in December, come come check it out. It's going to be cool. Great, great. I know, Shireen, you have to leave. So maybe, Jack, Jake, uh, say a little bit what, about you, you know what you guys are working on. And um, then we will come to an end of the panel. Yeah. I can jump in really fast. Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, so Kila Batra and Death More Radiant uh, will premiere at the Arab American National Museum in December. And it is looking at 
um, women and queer people of Arab backgrounds, histories and identities um, from Cleopatra's time, Cairo in the 1920s to today. Um, very excited about that. Mariam Bazid is one of the writers who's also a prelude artist. So check them out if you can. Um, and then Fire in the Theater is, uh, as I said, is looking at um, uh, free speech in the digital age. And we're sort of trying to ask this question, especially as most of our ensemble comes from marginalized communities, how do we balance safety and free speech and expression as a value that we have as artists in, in, one, in one idea? How do we hold both things to be um, as, you know, as as important, and how do we take care of each other within that question? Yeah, well, thank you. And as you all could hear now, um, this is significant work. It's uh, deeply engaged. It's vibrant, and um, and uh, uh, it is uh, something we all should pay more attention to. And I think also, in case funders are listening, people are thinking where do resources go. Um, I think this is um, a place uh, where. Um, uh, a change should take place. There is a lot of talk about change, but one of them also is to really encourage and and, and fund and bring more resources to, to this work that's happening anyway, but it, as we all could hear, um, really uh, needs um, uh, support for the service they do to the communities and um, and they make them a place. So it was, it was a, a great privilege to have you guys with us and a very good reminder um, to keep also our minds open here at the Seattle Center. And sometimes we know a little bit more what's happening in Europe or Asia than what's happening in America. And we shouldn't. It should be a different way. And the work, you know, the Fusebox Festival does is fantastic. And, uh, and I think everybody who loves theater should go there and say this is a place where you can also go instead of going um, to uh, Avignon or um, an, another festival. So um, thank you all for being with us. Uh, today we're going to give at uh, 2 o'clock an award to Shade from the National Black Theatre in Harlem for the work she has done for the New York theatre community and for running the Collision of Theatres of Color. There are 30 of them. Um, then tonight at 5 p.m., Hilary Miller will talk about the 70s with her colleague. She's a great researcher and teacher and writer about the city, the changes it went through. And sorry for you guys, it's again about New York. Um, but as uh, uh, Jake pointed out, we are the only festival that actually gives a place for New York artists. You know, there is not a place actually for, for the artists of New York um, where it celebrates the work, so a work in progress. So Hiller will really talk and look and what does it mean? How can we create meaning of this radical change when New York was he also knocked uh, knocked out a bit on the uh, and on the floor and um, tomorrow we will have three sessions um, um, about the CUNY theaters, one about New York cultural institutions, the cultural services, how we can create perhaps a festival and also with some curators to get idea if we need a festival at all, a big we feel a summer festival where also companies like yours could come, you know, how would that look like? What does the city really need? So we're going to go through that. And tonight, the great Sybil Kempson um, will will show her work at seven o'clock um, online. And I also encourage you guys, invite her, bring her over. She also, she moved outside New York and Hudson towards the Hudson Valley and, um, and lives that distance, perhaps a bit closer than you guys. And, um, and is creating work there. So thank you all for taking your time and energy and we admire you. We really uh, um, think that the work you are doing is of significance and it makes us all part of the civilized world and the world that was you know, dreamed up of mankind, I think, is to share ideas, um, to create imagination. And uh, so many problems we have now is because there's a failure of imagination, how life could be different. And I think every one of you and everyone who works with you and everyone who comes to your theater imagines a better and a different future. And theater performance is a place where that can be done. So I went a little bit over time. I hope my team will forgive me, but it's just three minutes. But still, we, uh, we are a bit under pressure, so I have to um, um, say goodbye. I want all of you to come by to the Siegel Center when you are here. Please do say hello. And if I'm anywhere close to you, I will also come and see you. So this is a beginning, maybe also of a longer dialogue. So thank you again, Jake, for um, uh, you know making us you know aware that there are things we should look at that we should also consider in the new times we live in, and you know that perhaps now that idea of of the experimental theater shouldn't be localized uh, by location and. And perhaps this is also one of the advantages of that digital age we entered that you see now we can talk. So thank you all. Thanks for HowlRound again uh, for uh, hosting us. It's such a great privilege to be uh, with a great 
uh, institution and Thea and VJ and then the Siegel team, Andy and Tanvi, of course, the Cactus Juice in Mumbai for making this happen. And to our listeners, there's so many uh, offerings out there for you to take your time, listen in what our friends and colleagues have to say from around the country. It's uh, important to them that someone listens and also for us. Um, that you have the interest and hopefully maybe there's something inside there for your own life and for your own work, how to make plays, how to connect, because they are giving us examples or this, but it's ultimately about also you, the listener, and how to create a more meaningful life. So thank you all and uh, goodbye. And I hope to see you all soon in person. Bye-bye. Thanks, y'all. appreciate it. Oh, yeah. <laughs>